بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أنبياء الله جميعا وعلى سيدهم وخاتمهم حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين والصفوة من أصحابه المنتجبين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاستجاب لهم ربهم أني لا أضيع عمل عامل منكم من ذكر أو أنثى بعضكم من بعض صدق الله العلي العظيم What you see on the board, the title of this presentation tonight is one of the most controversial subjects among the Muslims and non-Muslims. What is the role of men and women in today's society? Islam teaches us that men and women are not to compete with each other, but to complement and integrate each other. We cannot say the role of men is more important than the role of women. Neither we can say the role of women is more important than the role of men. Men do not surpass and are not superior to women. Neither women can surpass or are superior to men. Each one has its own position and location and role and significance in the society. Both roles are important and very much needed in this society. When it comes to their worth, and their merits and their value, they are equal. When it comes to their responsibilities and their rights, they are equal to. Men do not have more rights in Islam. In Islam, men do not have more rights than women. Women not, are not inferior to men. There is no verse in this book in this entire book, the Holy Quran, there is no verse that suggests that men should dominate the family or the society, or they are more important than women, or women should subjugate themselves to the will of men. There is no verse in this holy book that suggests these things. In the eyes of God, they are important, they are equal. But then, my friends, equality does not necessarily mean identicalness. Equality is something, and identicalness is something else. They are two different things. And therefore, there are many verses in the Quran, when they speak about them, they put them equal to each other. Their role is equal. Their contribution also is equal. فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ أَنِّي لَا أُضِيعُ عَمَلَ عَامِلٍ مِّنْكُمْ مِّنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى God says, I'm not going to waste the work, the production, the contribution of neither men or women, neither male or female when they work, when they give. Another verse says, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَلَنُحْيَنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبَةً وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْرَهُمْ بِأَحْسَنِ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Whoever works, be it male or female, and they have faith and connection to God, we will reward them with the best reward in this life. We will grant them a beautiful life here, and a big reward in the hereafter. 
When we come to the nucleus, in the nucleus we have the protons and what else? Hmm? Protons and neutrons. Which one is more important, the protons or the neutrons? Which one is more important? Both of them are important. Both of them are needed. This is the nucleus of the society. Male and female, men and women, both of them are important in the eyes of God. Now, we have to confess that in the past, for many centuries, whether it is in the Islamic society or outside the Islamic society, women have been forgotten, they have been neglected, and yes, they have been abused and wronged. And this abuse sometimes continues in some countries, in some societies until today. Until today, women have no role in certain countries. I don't want to mention these countries, but you know them. Women are not even secondary citizens in these countries. They consider them as an object that God created to serve men only. Their job, their responsibility is just to serve men, to entertain men. So they don't need any education. They don't need any freedom. They don't deserve any respect because they are treated like animals. But who is responsible for that? Is this book responsible for that? Is this religion, the Islamic faith responsible? Is God responsible for that? It's not. It's some men who are narrow-minded. Some men who are ignorant. It's the responsibility of a patriarch society. The patriarch society who hates women, misogynist society, misogynist mentality that existed for a long time and it will exist for many centuries to come. And we can find it in many countries in many religions too, not just within the Islamic faith. In other faiths too, there are some people who don't like women and there are some politicians, some presidents who are misogynist. They hate women. They disrespect women. We can find them today in today's world. So we cannot blame Islam for that. So we have to acknowledge, in the past, women have been wronged and abused and marginalized. And of course, they were assigned a task at home. Women were assigned certain tasks and men were assigned certain tasks. The task of women was confined within the boundaries of the home. So she had to clean, she has to cook, she has to make herself available for her husband she had to take care of, you know, changing the diapers, cleaning her children, and she had no say. She had no role. She could not even venture outside the house. She could not go to school. She was deprived from many of her rights. On the other hand, men would take care of their responsibilities outside the house, and they were privileged. And even in certain laws, you can look at certain articles of law. They give preference to men over women. In some writings, in some books, in some sayings, in some speeches, in some statements, Muslim and non-Muslim leaders, they give preference to men over women. This is the result of a patriarch society. This is the result of a society being hijacked by men and they impose their will and their thinking over that society. But this is not necessarily what this book, what Islam says. Now today, the situation is changing, not only in America and Europe, but even in Muslim countries and Muslim societies. Women are gaining some freedom. Women are venturing outside their homes. 
Today, the responsibilities of men and women, they overlap with each other. They, they are intertwined and intertwisted. You cannot say this role today belongs only to men and this role belongs only to women. They overlap. Today, we find women are contributing in almost every field of life, in political field, economic, even military, aviation, aerospace, uh, industries, uh, education, healthcare, security, you name it. Which is good, it's not bad, it's not bad. Islam does not say this field is forbidden. Women cannot venture into this field. There is no saying like that in Islam. Islam says as long as they can contribute, they can serve, they can help, they can give, they can go into these fields provided that, provided that, they maintain their dignity and their chastity and their value. As long as they maintain their value, they do not compromise their dignity and their chastity, afaf, afaf is chastity, then they can contribute. Nothing is forbidden. Let them give. But my friends, women, they prove to be competitive, professional, successful in these fields. But on the other hand, we see some casualties too. Not everything which is halal, religion says it's okay and halal, is appropriate too. Sometimes things are halal, religion says yes. Religion says yes to them, you can perform them, you can, you can do these things, but it's not appropriate. Such as what? There are thousands of examples. A simple example, I'm talking to you now. Can Mushtaba bring me a sandwich? While I'm talking, I grab the sandwich and eat. Is this halal or haram? If I'm eating now here, right before you, while I'm speaking, is it halal or haram? I'm asking simple question. Halal or haram? Halal. But is it appropriate? It's not appropriate. The other example, I'm a man in Islam. Is it okay for me to marry four wives? Is it halal or haram? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> but is it appropriate here in this culture? Not, not even here in, in Islamic countries. Is it appropriate? I don't see it appropriate. Though God says, yes, you can do it. But I know it's not appropriate for me. I'm going to lose my family. I'm going to lose my kids. I'm going to, to lose the respect of my wife and my kids and my grandchildren. So although it is halal for me, permissible, God is not going to punish me. But I'm not going to do that. Because halal is one thing and appropriate is something else. So women, they can venture into every field in life. They can go to the military. They can be military officers. They can do whatever they want to do. But sometimes there is a price to pay when they leave the family. There is something important and something more important. Many girls today argue that my career is very important to me. I'm a lawyer, I'm a physician, okay? I'm a businesswoman. My career is important to me. Yes, it's very important and I'm a proud of you. I'm a proud of you. If you are a lawyer, if you are a physician, if you are a businesswoman, I'm a proud of you. If you are a teacher, if you are a nurse, I'm very proud of you. But there is something more important. And who decides which one is important and which one is more important? It's you. It's not me. It's not the man. It's not your father or your husband. You decide. When you have wisdom and farsightedness, you're going to decide. Which one is more important? Your career or your family? 
So you have to decide. Sometimes, sometimes you don't have kids, you are single, or you are married without kids, and your husband is okay with you working outside for long hours, or your kids are grown up. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Your kids are grown up, they don't need much attention. So you can put your career first. But sometimes you have little kids at home. They need you. They need your love. They need your attention. So do you sacrifice your family, your kids for the sake of your career? You can answer this question, not me. You have to answer this question. I read the memoir of Gorbachev. Many of you do not remember him. He was the last president of the Soviet Union. After him, the Soviet Union collapsed. Do you remember this name? Mikhail Gorbachev? Who remembers this name? None of you, because you are young. You are in your 30s. Those who are in their 50s and 60s, they remember him. He said, he said, we in the Soviet Union, when we forced women to leave their homes and their families and their kids and go and work in the factories, we thought we are doing something good for the society. But after many decades, we realized, yes, when it came to industries, we profited, but we lost where? We lost at home. We lost our kids. We lost many generations. Kids were grown up, they are growing without the affection, without the love of the mother, because the mother is spending most of her time outside, outside the house. By the time she comes back home, she's exhausted, she's tired. She doesn't have time, she doesn't have energy to take care of her kids. So they were neglected. And when a child is being raised with no affection, with no love, with no care, with no mercy, he will be a very dangerous human being. Very dangerous human being. God created women for a certain task, to be the embodiment of love, the personification of affection and mercy and emotion. These qualities are not found in men. The qualities of real love, real affection, real emotion, real mercy are not found in, in men. We do have them, but the percentage that you, you possess is much higher than us, much higher than men. This is why mothers are the glue that brings, keeps the family together. You are closer to your mother than your father. No matter how your father is important in your life, at the end of the day, your mother is much closer. And this is why when someone comes to the Prophet and says to him, Oh, Ya Rasulullah, who's closer to me? Who deserves my help first? The Prophet said, first, your mother. He, second, who's, he said, who's second? He said, your mother. He asked, who's third? He said, again, your mother. And then when he asked, who's fourth? He said, your father. The Prophet said to him, ummuka, ummuka, ummuk. Your mother, your mother, your mother, and then your father. If you are a great person today, if you are a successful person today, if you are an affectionate person, if you are a thoughtful person, the credit goes to your mother first and to your father second. And I say this because of an experience. I'm a father and I'm a grandfather. And I spend much of my time with my family. And I know what I'm talking about. You are the products of your mothers. So he says, when we force them to leave their homes and go and work in the factories, 
we lost many generations. Many generations. And that led to many crimes. That led to the disintegration of the society, the weakness of the society. And God wants the society to be strong. We have to acknowledge that women are different from men. They are different physiologically, psychologically, biologically, and physically. We are different. We are not the same. And therefore, God created two genders. He could have created mankind only men, one gender. He could have done that. Why did he create Adam and Eve? He could have created only Adam and we have only men. Or he could have created only Eve, so we have only women in the society. Why he created Adam and Eve, men and women? Because each one has a certain task. No, no matter how women are affectionate and able and a professional, they cannot replace men. I know my friends, I know in my city, in my community, many women, single mothers, who are very successful, who are very caring indeed. They sacrifice their life for the sake of their kids. They are either widows or divorcee. They lost their husbands. They don't have a man at home. Though they are doing everything possible to take care of their kids, at the end of the day, there is some deficiency. Why? They say, because my kids, they are missing a father figure, a male figure at home. They need a male at home. I'm doing everything. I'm the breadwinner. I'm taking care of them. I'm taking them to school. I'm taking them to the doctor's office. I am there for them. I am, I'm providing them food, clothing. I am teaching them. I'm training them. I'm raising them. At the end of the day, my kids, they need a father figure. They need a male. A mother cannot do the work of a father. A wife cannot do the work of a husband. Therefore, we have to say to the husbands and the fathers, your role is equally important at home. Do not abandon your family. Don't throw the load on your wife and tell her you take care of those kids because I'm working outside. You have a role. You cannot be absent from your family. You have a big responsibility. Your absence is going to create a disaster. Even if your wife very strong, very independent, very professional, very educated, very patient, you need to be there because you are a father. The kids, they need to see both right before their eyes. They need to see the father and the mother working together. This is the beautiful family. Because men and women, they integrate each other. They complement each other. They don't compete. They complement each other. So, God created men and women not only for sexual pleasure. There is more into it. Because each one has a specific role. And there is no replacement for that role. If man is missing, Nobody is going to fill that void. If women, the mother is missing, the man is not going to fill that void. Because each one of them is being equipped with the necessary equipment to function, to take care of their roles. Men are successful in certain fields and women are successful in certain fields. I personally, if you ask me, I prefer for a physician, for a nurse, for a teacher, for a principal of a school to be a female. I believe personally, I could be wrong, but I think I'm right, that 
she is more equipped, more fit to play this role. The role of a physician, of a nurse, of a teacher for my kids and for a principal of the school. When it comes to other roles, when it comes to the military, for instance, a soldier, military officer, I prefer the man to play that role. Or a street sweeper, or a construction worker. I don't like to see a woman being a construction worker because the man is well equipped to undertake that responsibility, more equipped. We need the female's passion, the female's affection, the female's love when it comes to raising children. We need her patience more. When it comes to men, we need their physical strength. We need their muscles. Of course, we need the brain of both men and women. But when it comes to certain fields, we need more patience and more love. And this when it comes to teaching and nursing. But when it comes to physical activities, we need, what do we need? We need muscles. We need physical strength. And here, these roles cannot overlap. And when they overlap, they cause a failure. Failure in the society and failure in the family. So, to recap here, my friends, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. God created men and women for each other. Men cannot continue their journey in this life without the help, the care, the love, the mercy, the attention of women. No women can reach their potential in this life without the help, the encouragement, the inspiration, the support, the chivalry, the magnanimity of men. We need each other. And because we need each other, God said the marriage has to be between a male and female to keep the family healthy and strong, to raise good children. You need the contribution of both, the male and the female. They need to be present. They complement each other. And if one of them is missing, there will be a void. I've seen families, when the mother is missing, the father says, I'm taking care of them. There is no female in the family. The kids are not natural. They don't act natural. And I have seen also, when the father is absent and the mother is alone taking care of those kids, again, they are not natural. There is a void. There is a problem there. There is a psychological problem there. This is why we need to keep the family together. Both of them are important. And this is what God says in the book. Good and faithful men and women are the protectors and maintainers and the defenders of each other. Society cannot run only by men. It's a disaster. Look at Afghanistan Taliban. A society which is controlled only by men. A failure. Why people are leaving Afghanistan? Now I'm talking to you and thousands of people are fleeing the country. Not because they don't have food. Not because they don't have shelter. Not because of the weather. But because there is a gang Gangsters call themselves Muslims. They rule in the name of Islam. Destroying their country and their society, abusing women. When you abuse women, you are destroying the entire society. Men are not going to gain when you destroy women. 
The first losers are men. When you put your wife down, when you put your daughter down, when you put your sister down, you're going to lose first. If you want a healthy family, empower your wife. Empower her. Support her. Give her the support that she deserves. If you want to see your kids being leaders in the future, you cannot put your wife down. You have to stand with her. You have to encourage her. You have to empower her. You have to make her always happy, always smiling. Some men think that when I put my wife down, I'm going to win the love, the affection of my kids. You are not right. You are not right. And the same thing, when women put their men down, the husband down, they think that they're going to take care of the family. I don't need a man in my life. I'm independent. I have a career. I have a business. I have an income. I'm able. I am free. Therefore, I'm going to take care of my kids by myself. You are wrong. You are not right. I know many of my friends, female friends I have in my community. They tell me because they assume the role of the breadwinner in the family. They don't have husbands. Or maybe they have a husband, but he's useless, sitting at home doing nothing. The wife has to work. Those women, those, this type of women, they get exhausted and tired after a while. She says, yes, I have a good certificate from the best university. I'm intelligent. But at the end of the day, I am not equipped for this role. I can do it for a few years. After that, I get knocked down. She's not equipped for that role, to be a breadwinner. And this is why God says in the Quran that men have more responsibility. Why? They have more responsibility, not more control. There is a difference between responsibility and control. God says men and husbands have more responsibilities in the family because they are the breadwinners. Because they are the breadwinners. They sustain the family economically. They bring food home. This is their big responsibility. They protect their families. Therefore, they have a bigger response. Means, it means exactly that men have more responsibility in maintaining and taking care of their families. Some people misunderstand it. They misunderstand the term qawamun. They say qawamun means they have more control. They are the masters of the family. They are the dictators in the family. They have the you know, upper hand in the family. They have the last say in the family. It's not about the last say. It's about cooperation. We put two people together to work together. None of them is above the other. They are equal. They have more responsibility outside the home. They have more responsibility. It's about responsibility. It's not about privileges. It's not because men have more privilege than women. So I have many of my friends, they say after a period of time, I'm working, I'm a professional, but I get tired. My life is not fulfilling. I'm not enjoying my life. Why? Because she puts herself in the wrong position, in the wrong place. I'm not against women working. No, no, don't get me wrong. I'm saying it, de it depends on your circumstances. If you are a female, okay, single or married with no kids, or you have kids and your kids are grown up, they don't need your daily attention, you may enjoy your work outside the house. You may work five hours, eight hours, 10 hours in your office, in the hospital, in the school, in the office. But when you have kids at home, the family is first. Your family is first. There are priorities in this life. We cannot mix them up. The family, the kids are first. <laughs> Because when you raise one child, one child, be it female or male, in a good way, in a noble way, 
in a humane way, you instill good values in this child because the babysitter cannot instill. Babysitter can put the food in his mouth, but cannot put values in his heart and mind. This is your job as a mother. Only mother can do that. Babysitters cannot. Babysitters are strangers. Babysitters, this baby is not theirs. They are being hired to do certain things. They get the money and they leave. Whereas this baby is yours, part of you. You carried this baby for nine months. You cannot abandon him now. You cannot abandon her now. They need your presence. They need your love, your affection. When women here work or elsewhere from nine to five, they come back home with no energy, with no energy left. They need someone to cook for them, to prepare the meal, to take care of them. They don't have time to take care of their kids. And therefore kids with no attention and with no love, many of them, not all, we cannot generalize, but many of them would end up behind bars. Behind bars means in the prisons. Go and check it out. The surveys they study, the study, many studies say that those people behind bars, when you interview them, when you investigate their life, you find out that they were raised with no good and caring mother. And some of them with no good and caring parents. They had no good fathers, responsible fathers, and no good and caring mothers. This is why they are behind bars. So, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In the past, women were assigned the task of cleaning the home. Cleaning and washing and cooking and you know. Today, her role is much bigger. Today she has to clean the society, not physically clean the home. God created women, females, to clean the society, to empower society, to get rid of the ills of the society. The best cure for anxiety and depression is your mother. If you have a good mother and you can spend some time with your mother and listen to your mother and respect your mother, that would be the best cure for your anxiety, for your depression. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam suffered a lot in Mecca for a period of 13 years. Every single day he leaves the home, he is faced by the aggression of the Meccans against him, by the assault of the Meccans. Who was behind him? Who was supporting him? Who was providing him with, with perseverance, with encouragement, with love, with healing? Who? Lady Khadija, a female. This is why the Prophet, he kept remembering Khadija for so many years, even after her death, even after he got married with many other women in Medina, he kept remembering Khadija. Even in Medina, after so many times, so many years, he would say, Khadija, wa ma adraka man Khadija. Khadija, and how do you know who Khadija is or was? Some of his women, they got jealous. They said to him, God has given you a virgin, young lady, beautiful lady. You are still remembering Khadija? He said, what Khadija did to me, no other female is able to do. She provided me with real care. I was broke, I was hungry. Alam yajitka yatiman fa'awa wa wajadaka dhalan fa'hada wa wajadaka a'ilan. A'ilan means broke. You have no food to eat. You have no shelter. God gave Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
in the early days of his mission, two heroes. One of them is Abu Talib, alayhi salam. The second is a female, Khadija. And later on, God replaced. When God took Abu Talib and Khadija, he replaced them with another good man and another good woman. The good man was Ali ibn Abi Talib. The good woman and good lady was Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. So the Prophet, he would find solace and peace when Khadija comes and she shelters him with her love. She talks to the Prophet, she counsels the Prophet. We men, we need counseling. Who's our counselor? Our wives, our partners. If you have a mother, then it is your mother. After you get married, it's your mother and your wife. They are your counselors. This is why God created females for us and he created male for female. To be counselors, to be comforters. They comfort each other. They complement each other. So these roles cannot overlap. When a man sits at home and he does nothing and he allows, he puts all the load on the shoulder of his wife, he is wrong. He's not doing justice neither to himself nor to his family. That family is going to collapse. Some men, they don't do anything. They expect their wives to pay the bills, the rent, take care of the kids, to go for shopping, to take kids to the school, to take, take them to the doctor's office today, to do all things from A to Z. This is not right. It's not right. You have a role. You are a leader. A father means you are a leader at home. You are not just a breadwinner. You are a leader. You are an example. I know many of you guys here. I've been knowing you for the last few years since I started coming to the Netherlands. Many of you are heroes. In my eyes, I admire you. Men and women, I know some of you personally. You are heroes because of your parents, because of your father and your mother, because your parents were your example. This is why you are here. Because your parents, they invested their life in raising you, empowering you, in making you, creating you. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَاجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا our role in this life is to be a role model. That's it. If you can be a role model, you can go to paradise easily. You don't have to climb Mount Everest. God does not say you have to climb Mount Everest so you can go to paradise. If you can be a role model to your kids, to your family, to your community, that's it. You are done. You are done. We have to be a role model. Uh, one last thing, I have maybe two or more, few more minutes. Let me conclude with something very important that many people are asking about it. They ask about this. There is a hadith that is attributed to Lady Fatima to Zahra, alayhi salam. The hadith says, Fatima, Lady Fatima, said the best thing for a female خير للمرأة ألا ترى رجلا ولا يراها رجل the best thing for a female is not to see a man neither a man sees her so what do you say about this this means that women have to close their eyes 24 7 they don't see men so how do we do how do we manage this? How can you go to school and learn and work and give to your society and contribute if you don't see men? Huh? Can someone answer this question for me? And this hadith is, is authentic, huh? not fabrication. This is an authentic hadith. Can someone solve this problem, this mystery? 
How can a female not to see a male, neither for the male to see her? How can she progress? How can she live? Can you live here today in this society without seeing men, without talking, without interacting, without working with them? Can you do that? You can't. You have to stay in, the, in, in your bedroom and lock the door. So how do we interpret this hadith? What do you think? I need to hear from you. Uh-huh, please. I think it's lower the gaze. Ahsant. Lower the gaze. The hadith is not saying that women have to close their eyes and segregate themselves completely from the society. This cannot happen to maybe in the past this was doable, maybe. Because women were most of the time were indoors. They don't leave their homes because men were doing all the work outside. So women had to stay at home. This is why, my friends, in Salat al Jumu'ah, if you read some of the books of fiqh, the Islamic ruling, it says the Friday prayers is for men and it is makruh and desirable for women to attend the Friday prayers. Why? Because in the old days, women would not even go outside. They don't leave the home. So if one of them would leave the home, she will get some attention from men. This is something strange. They start looking at her. All people are going to look at her. She's going to be the center of attention. Islam therefore said, let her stay at home. But nowadays, women are everywhere. This is not something strange when a woman leaves the home. So the ruling has to change today. I always say women have to attend the Friday prayers. If, you don't, if they don't go, if they don't learn, if they don't sit, if they don't interact, if they don't socialize with other women, they are not going to learn. How are they going to teach their kids if they don't know? Women are the teachers, the mentors to their kids. So if they don't go and learn, imagine we are we having only men here. There are no women. Is this fair? Do you accept this? You don't accept that because this is half of the society. They have to come. They have to interact. They have to learn. They have to ask. They have to debate. They have to discuss. They have to listen. They have to speak in order for them to be good teachers. So in the old days, this was strange for a woman to venture outside her house. But nowadays, it's normal. And therefore, the hadith that Lady Fatima said suggests that Allah tara rajulan wa la yaraha rajul the look and the gaze is not seductive, is not suspicious, is not with desire. A look is a normal look. Otherwise, Lady Fatima herself, she's, in my opinion, and in the opinion of God too, she's the best woman, the best female God has ever created in this universe from the beginning till the end. They came to the Prophet, they said, Ya Rasulullah, you are saying, Fatima is the mistress of the ladies. Where is Maryam? God is saying this about Maryam. Ya Maryam, inna Allah astafaki wa tahharaki wa astafaki ala nisa'il alameen. Maryam is the mistress of the old ladies. He said, yes, Maryam is the mistress of all ladies of her time. But my daughter Fatima is the mistress of the ladies min al awwaleen ila al akhirin from the beginning till the end. And this lady Fatima, she herself went outside the house. She went to the mosque of the Prophet. She stood at the pulpit of the Prophet, Mimbarun Nabi, and she gave a speech. But she was covered, of course. She spoke in public. Many of the virtuous people of the Sahaba, like Salman al Farisi, Abu Dhar al Ghifari, Ammar ibn Yasir, they would come to the home of Fatima and pay her a visit. They visit her, they sit, they talk with her. If this is forbidden, 
then Fatima should not do that because she is the first example for females. So that means this seductive gaze is forbidden. Otherwise, when they interact, as the Quran says, فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ فِي الْقَوْلِ فَيَطْمَعَ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَضٍ If you interact in an appropriate way, in an honorable way, without seduction, without desire, then this is okay. You can go about your school, your work, your business, your life, go to the hospital, go to the street, go to the marketplace, go to, to your university, go to the parliament, be a member of your parliament, be a minister in a government, be an active member of the society. Nothing wrong with that. As long as you keep the boundaries, tilka hududullah, keep the limits, keep your chastity, maintain, do not compromise, do not sell your chastity. Intergender relations in Islam is not forbidden. We are not like Taliban. We have, they segregate men from women completely. No, this is not right. At our mosques, at our institutions, we need to have both of them there. And we teach them how to interact with each other. We teach them the etiquette, the manner. Because if you don't teach them now, they are not going to learn it. Tell the boys that those girls treat them like your sisters. You don't want anyone to come and hurt your sister. You don't want anyone to abuse your sister. So you don't abuse people's sisters. Don't do that. This is how we have to teach them. So intergender relations in Islam is based on what? On chastity, on honor, on defending each other. وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءِ Protectors. Men are protectors of women and women are the protectors of men. بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ I should stop here to open the floor for discussion tonight. So please feel free to ask, to criticize,